In the last video lecture, we looked at how organisms interacted with their environment. And in discussing those interactions, we came across the definition of biotic or living components of the environment and abiotic or non-living components of the environment. In discussing abiotic components of the environment, we often find across the surface of the earth that there is an uneven distribution of those abiotic components. So for example, uh, if we look at the Sahara Desert, it might be very warm, and very dry. If we look at the tropical rainforest of Brazil, it might be very wet and warm. And if we look at the Arctic, we might find that we have areas that are both cold and dry. And so what causes those uneven distribution of certain abiotic components is weather. And weather is determined or can vary based on the seasons. So if I'm in Guadalajara during the rainy season, I might expect a lot of rain. But if I come in March or April, there might be much less. So what we're going to discuss in this video lecture is what's causing the seasonality across the surf surface of the earth. And to be able to talk about what's causing the seasons, you need to first understand what's causing the changes in temperature. And so that's where we're going to look at the curvature of the earth affecting how intense the sunlight is. And so what this diagram is trying to show you is an equal amount of sunlight hitting various parts of the earth. If you look at the equator, the sunlight that's hitting there is very concentrated in a relatively small surface area. If you look at the poles, you'll find that the same amount of light is responsible for covering a much larger surface area. And so at the equator, there's more intense sunlight. And that's important because sunlight is going to heat the earth. And the way that it does that is when a highly energized um, particle of light hits a piece of matter, it can sometimes vibrate as a result of that collision and remember that when molecules are vibrating more intensely we call that heat so the more sunlight that hits the molecules the more vibration and the more vibration the hotter things are so when you have a small surface area that that sunlight has to cover you're gonna get a lot more heat and that's why we find the equator is quite warm now the seasons are caused because the earth is not exactly rotating on a perfect axis, it's a little bit tilted. So what you're seeing in this diagram is how in different times of the year, different parts of the earth are under the most direct intense sunlight. And so if you look at the top left hand corner, what we're looking at is the southern hemisphere in summer. So you can see at the middle of the diagram you have the most intense sunlight and so the most intense sunlight is hitting the southern part of the earth and therefore it's a lot warmer. And then on the northern hemisphere you'd be having winter. If you look at the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the exact opposite where summer is in the northern hemisphere and you have winter in the southern hemisphere. And that's because the most intense light is hitting a little bit further north of the equator at the Tropic of Cancer. So why is the equator always hot? Because at any given time of the year, you have a number or you have a, quite a bit amount of intense sunlight hitting there compared to the other sur or compared to the other parts of the Earth's surface. In the top left hand corner, you're going to find a diagram of the seasons of the Earth, and what this is trying to reinforce is that it's the tilt of the Earth that causes the seasons not the distance from the sun that causes the season. So you can see in the diagram they've done a good job of trying to keep the earth relatively equidistant to the sun so you can see that that's not causing the summer it's the fact that you have more direct intense sunlight in the northern hemisphere than you do at other times of the year. Down in the bottom right hand corner what you're seeing is how those temperature discrepancies on the surface of the earth can result in differences in the amount of precipitation that a various area receives. And so what you can see in the bottom right hand diagram is that at the equator 
you have uh, the most direct intense sunlight and that's going to heat things up. As the air gets hotter it's going to cause evaporation and the air is going to become moist. As the moist hot air rises it's going to come into contact with cold air which is going to cause condensation and then you're going to have a high amount of rainfall. That w air that was once warm and wet now becomes cool and dry. It moves back down closer to the surface of the earth and eventually begins to heat up again and that's going to form our deserts. And so what you can see over on the far right hand part of this diagram is that there are certain areas of the earth that receive high amounts of rainfall and certain areas that are quite dry. So we tend to find the deserts of earth both at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south where we have this dry air meeting. Seasons can also cause a certain phenomenon in freshwater lakes. So one of the things that we're going to learn this year is that water is most dense at 4 degrees Celsius and that ice is actually less dense than water at 4 degrees Celsius. So what does that mean? That means that in the winter time, when the air is very cold outside, it will cause the surface of the lake to start to freeze. Now, if it were like other liquid substances, as it was freezing, it would become denser and sink to the bottom, and basically a lake would freeze from the bottom up. But that's not what happens because water is more dense at four degrees, and so what you're going to see at the surface of the earth or surface of the water is that it's going to freeze over first. And as it gets colder and colder and colder throughout the winter, the ice will get thicker and thicker and thicker, but there's always going to be down at the bottom uh, four degrees Celsius water. Unless you have a really shallow lake, in which case they can freeze over, and when that happens, you can potentially kill all or most of the life that lives inside of that lake. So what you can see in the spring is that all the water is four degrees Celsius and so what's going to happen is you're going to have continual turnover. Eventually the temperature outside is going to have higher than four degrees Celsius and you're going to start to see there be warmer water on the surface of the earth or on the surface of the lake and then colder water as you get down. But it's really important that at some point in the springtime, the entire lake will be 4 degrees Celsius. Because that's going to mean that there's internal currents in the lake that are going to spread the nutrients throughout. So if one area had a high amount of uh, oxygen, then it would then be distributed throughout the lake. If one area had a high amount of let's say calcium, then it could also potentially spread throughout the lake. So every year or every half year, there's a turnover inside of lakes which distributes the nutrients evenly. What you're seeing in the summertime is that all the water at the surface is closer to the temperature outside and you're still going to have in the lake a section of where it's four degrees Celsius so the cold water is staying down close to the bottom because it's most dense. What you're going to see in a lake in the summertime is that there's going to be a high amount of oxygen concentrated at the surface. And the reason for that is photosynthetic activity. Remember that one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. And so the more photosynthesis that's happening, the more oxygen you'll find. In the autumn, things start to cool down again, and as the temperature outside starts to drop, at some point again you will reach this, this point in time where all the water inside of the lake is 4 degrees Celsius, and the nutrients are cycling throughout the lake. And then we get again winter, where the lake freezes over from the top down.